Good evening. Thank you for joining us tonight as we look into God's Word. I think we've got a good study, and I'm glad that you're joining with us. Before we get into the Word, I want to welcome you. I want to encourage you to touch base with us. Check in. Let us know where you are. Let us know how we can pray with you and pray for you. And so just uh, feel comfortable with uh, knowing that you're part of our body, that you're part of our family, and we want you to feel that way. So let's uh, open with prayer, and I'd like to once again pray for Cuba, pray for our world situation, and pray that God would just minister in a very real and wonderful way. Let's pray together. Father God, we are so thankful for your spirit, and all over the world, your spirit is moving, and we give you praise for it. But in the midst of the moving of your spirit, there's many heartaches, there's many trials, there's many difficulties, and we pray for those people that are going through those times. We pray particularly for the nation of Cuba. We pray for the those that are being bombarded, those that have been arrested, those that children have been taken away from homes. We ask you to minister to them even right now. And God, give wisdom and discernment and knowing what we can do and what should be done. Now have your way in, in Cuba. Have your way in this message today. Let it become real to our hearts and strengthen us and encourage us to help us all to be more like you. God, we pray for those that may be sick that are listening in today. We pray, Lord, that you would bring healing. Those that are overcoming COVID and uh, God, that you would minister to them. God, have your way in our hearts and lives today. And we thank you for it. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Right at the beginning of COVID, I preached a message that uh, had been impressed upon my heart very strongly. It was... A simple message that simply said, our assignment hasn't changed. Well, what is our assignment? If I can understand the scriptures correctly, our assignment is to love God, love our neighbor as ourselves, and to spread the good news. And even though we've been in the COVID now for about 18 months, the reality is our assignment still has not changed. Circumstances change. Methods change, situations change, locations change, but our assignment remains the same. We're to love God, love our neighbor, and spread the good news. My good friend Malcolm Burley wrote an awesome book, and I recommend it to everyone. The title is Agenda Driven or Assignment Led. And in his book, he quotes Hebrews 10, 5 through 7, and I'd like to read that at this time. Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body have you prepared for me. In burnt offerings and sin offerings you have taken no pleasure. Then I said, remember this Jesus speaking, he said, Behold, I have come to do your will, as is written of me in the scroll of the book. Jesus was saying, I came to do your will. A body has been prepared for me. So again, Malcolm then adds these words. Agenda people control with their title. Assignment led people serve with their towel. Man, that's an awesome quote. I always had a thought of it. But Malcolm said, agenda people control with their title. But assignment-led people serve with their towel. So I ask the question, how do we fulfill our assignment? In my opinion, we, and when I say we, I mean the church. We may be coming up short in all three aspects or all three accounts. I really think we come up short sometimes in loving God. We come up short and going into the whole world and preaching the gospel. But today I want to at least start addressing the middle one, loving our neighbor, loving our neighbor as ourself. And we we pose that question or that statement, it raises a number of questions. One is, how do we do that? One is the one that's asking scripture, who is my neighbor? Then we have to ask, well, what are God's expectations 
does he really expect us to love our neighbors as ourselves? Is that a real expect, uh, expectation? And not only that, it raises another question. Can we really love our neighbor as ourselves if we don't love ourselves? Good questions. John wrote some awesome words in John chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. These five verses are, are worthy of deep meditation and study. But today I just want to read them. John chapter 1, verse 14 through 18. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we have seen His glory, glory as of the only Son, from the Father, full of grace and truth full of grace and truth. John bore witness about him and cried out, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me ranks before me, because he was before me. For from his fullness we have all received grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses, and here's those words again, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Remember, it said that the Father, full of grace and truth, how did he reveal that grace and truth? He revealed that grace and truth by sending Jesus Christ into the world to redeem us. And it says, no one has ever seen God, the only God, who is at the Father's side. He has made him known. So we realize that Jesus was sent into the world to reveal who the Father was full of grace and truth. Now, I want to share with you the scripture that Eugene Peterson writes in the message. This uh, scripture is from his perspective, but I like the way he writes this message. And so I want to read it from the message. It says, The word became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. I love that. Jesus became flesh and blood and moved into the neighborhood. It goes on to say this. We saw the glory with our own eyes, the one of a kind glory, like father, like son, generous inside and out, true from start to finish. John pointed him out and called, this is the one, the one I told you coming after me. But in fact, was ahead of me. He was always been ahead of me, has always had the first word. We all live off his generous bounty, gift after gift after gift. We got the basics from Moses and then his exuberant giving and receiving, this endless knowing and understanding. All this came through Jesus the Messiah. No one has ever seen God, not so much as a glimpse, this one-of-a-kind God expression who exists at the very heart of the Father has made him plain as day. Wow, how great is that? And again, I go back to those words, the word became flesh and moved into the neighborhood. If we're going to be talking about loving our neighbor, we have to understand that Jesus became flesh and moved into our neighborhood so that we would see what it means to love our neighbor. John speaks a lot about Jesus, and he speaks a lot about Jesus and the Father, but he may have summed it up best in John chapter 14, where he speaks these words. John chapter 14, verse 6, Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you have known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do, not, you do know him, and you have seen him. And Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. And Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and you still do not know me? Philip, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that 
I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father, and the Father is in me, or else believe on account of the works themselves. Verse 12, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. And greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this will I do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. I don't know if you caught the gist of it, but when it talks about loving God and loving our neighbor, and we're to love our neighbor as ourself, we follow the example of Jesus. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And so if we're going to be followers of Christ, that's part of the uh, picture that we've got to have drawn. See, we're, we're called Christians. We that are believers are called Christians. Now, the word Christian is only used three times in the New Testament. Of course, none in the Old Testament. But Unger's Bible Dictionary states it this way. Becoming a Christian, according to the New Testament, is a definite act which signifies, or excuse me, with significant results. Let me read that again. Becoming a Christian, according to the New Testament, is a definite act with significant results. Of course, we understand the words to be like Christ. When visiting Israel, I was amazed at the looking out our tour bus and walking down the streets. I constantly saw a groups of people that were dressed alike. They had uh, one thing that made them unique is all of them had different styles of hats. And I asked the guide, I said, uh, why are they like that? And he said, well, they dress and act like their rabbi. They dress and act like their rabbi. If we're followers of Christ, now I don't want to get into clothesline preaching, but I think you understand when, it's, when I say we're to dress and act like Christ. We're to be his representative. People see Jesus through us. The term Christian originally was a derogatory term. Now, I was kind of surprised. I should have known this, but I, 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 it didn't register because I've always thought of Christians being a positive. We're Christians. But uh, Christian uh, originally was a derogatory uh, term that was used by the non-believers. It was not used by the church. It was not used by Christians. It was used by the world. And the Acts 11 tells us of the origination of the word Christian. Acts chapter 11, verse 20. Acts chapter 11, verse 20. But there were some of them, men of Cyprus and Cyrene, who on coming to Antioch spoke to the Hellenists, also preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number who believed turned to the Lord, or we could say became Christians. The report of this came to the ears of the church in Jerusalem, and they sent Barnabas to Antioch. When he came and saw the grace of God, what did Jesus come? Bring grace and truth. The grace of God, he was glad and he exhorted them all to remain faithful to the Lord with a steadfast purpose or to stay on assignment. For he was a good man, full of the Holy Spirit and of faith, and a great many people were added to the Lord. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look, look for Saul. Saul had been out of uh, circuit for a while. He had been converted, gone down to Tarsus, but Barnabas went to get him. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. And for a whole year, they met with the church and taught a great many people. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. Now, again, they were called by other people as those people, those people. 
Now, when we start talking about neighbors, we realize that that's kind of one of those phrases we often use. Those people, they're, they're different. They don't look like us. They don't dress like us. They're different. They're those people. But the reality is God wants us as Christians to be loving on those people, regardless of what those people signify, regardless of how different they are. God has asked us to do that. Now, over at near the close of the book of Acts, we find where Paul is before King Agrippa. And it says, uh, as he was before King Agrippa, he said these words, For the king knows about these things, and to him I speak boldly. For I am persuaded that none of these things has escaped his notice, for this had not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you believe. And Agrippa said to Paul, In a short time, would you persuade me to be a Christian? Would you persuade me to be one of those? King James says, you've almost persuaded me to be a Christian, to be one of those. Again, that was not a a, a positive statement. That was a, a negative. You want me to become one of those? And Paul said these words, whether short or long, I would to God that not only you, but also all who hear me this day might become such as I am, except for these chains. See, Paul was a prisoner. And when King Agrippa said, would you want me to become a Christian? He said, well, not only you, King Agrippa, but anyone, anyone that would hear me, I want them to be just like I am, except the chains. I don't want them to be imprisoned, but I want them to have the same relationship that I have with Jesus Christ. Now, for the church, the term Christian has become a word of honor to indicate that we are like Christ. Now, Jesus was a specific representation of God the Father. Many do not know Jesus. I said there are many in the world that do not know Jesus. I've said this quite a bit lately because it ties in with our assignment that we're to take the gospel to all nations because while we are anticipating the second coming of Christ, Many people in the world today are still waiting for him to come the first time because they've never heard the story of Jesus. Many do not know Jesus, but they know you. They know me. And you and I have to be the representation of God's grace and God's love. Jesus came to reveal God, full of grace and full of love. We have received Christ and have become Christians, Christ-like, and our assignment is to love God, to love our neighbor as ourselves, and to share this great news. But I want to close with, with this thought. You may be the only Bible someone is reading. You say, well, I don't know how you say that. Well, Paul said it first. He said, we're all living epistles. Now, the word epistle does not mean disciple. The word epistle means living letters. That you and I are living letters and that we are the examples. And so going back to those words that Uh, we started with and near the front, the word became flesh and blood and moved into our neighborhood. Friends, you and I are to represent Christ in our neighborhood. Next week, we're going to talk about and ask the question, who is my neighbor? But today I want us to think about that, that you may be the only Bible someone is reading. How true of a picture are they getting? Are they seeing more about works? Are they seeing more hatred? Are they seeing prejudice? Are they seeing anger? Or are they seeing the fruit of the Spirit? And are they seeing that the love and the grace of God being exhibited? That's quite a challenge for us. But our assignment hasn't changed. We still need to love our neighbor as ourselves. Let me pray with you and pray for you. 
Heavenly Father, we thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your word. And God, I know that I often fall far, far short of what you want me to be. And that's certainly not your fault. That's my fault of a failure to walk in the spirit. But God, I ask you to help me. Help me to realize that you've brought me into my neighborhood. You've brought me into my Jerusalem. You brought me into my Oxford, my, my, the villages, Summerfield, Stonecrest, Wildwood, all of the surrounding area. Where, where were you brought us to? You brought us into the neighborhood, just like Jesus came into the neighborhood to portray God's grace and God's love. Help us to fulfill that assignment. And God, we thank you for it. And God, I know that this message is for the church. I know it's for those, Lord, that know you. But if there are those that do not understand and know the love and the grace of God, I ask you to reveal yourself to them. Let them be ministered to by your spirit, then by the body of Christ, so that they too may become a Christian, someone following their rabbi. God, we give you praise for it, give you honor. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you for joining. Lord bless you. Next week, we're going to pick up there, Who is My Neighbor?